I'm going to start off with a really uh, very, what will sound like a very simple question, but it's incredibly important. And I thought we'd just go down the road this way, starting with John and ending with Randy. Look at John's getting a little bit nervous. But <laughs> if you think about, as you guys think about, or you, you folks think about your water utility and the primary concern that your governing body was trying to address in having any sort of a lead service line replacement program. What was that primary responsibility that motivated them to support it? John? Um, I, our commission, we're, we're ruled by a three-member board of commissioners, and they have always been concerned with the public health. And it's, it's a big thing in Boston. We're a medical community and everything else. We're driven by it. In fact, they constantly remind us that we're not just a supply of water, but we're a public health provider. By, by keeping people with good, safe, clean water. So that has always been the first thing on the Commission's mind, and that's why when it came to when we doubled the amount of assistance, they didn't even blink. They just said, it's costing us more, double the amount of money will help the people replace their lead service lines, anything for the public health. So that's the number one driver we have. Great, thank you. Kathy? Um, for Cincinnati, I think it's, it's a similar situation. We actually have a, a nine-member city council, a mayor and a city manager that, that run our city. And it's a, a case of, you know, this is a public health issue. And so as much as I've seen everything play out in the, in the media, you know, how does it pertain to us? And we need to make sure that, that our, our water supply is safe for our customers. Thank you very much. And Reed. Yeah, we were governed by a seven-member board. It's our mayor, three councilors, and three private citizens. But uh, I think my answer is similar to John's. I think we've been able to convince them that it's the right thing for us to do as a utility, that they understand the public health part of our mission, and this is probably the biggest public health challenge that we have now. Thank you. Randy, you want to wrap that up? Well, as I mentioned, we are also governed by a separate board outside of the, the city of Lansing. Um, and we really went wholeheartedly into this when, uh, like I said, the Washington, D.C. issues really started to surface, and we had local elected leaders that were kind of forcing the issue. So we, while we didn't go into this begrudgingly, we were kind of pushed into uh, the lead service replacement program. So Randy, we'll stick with you and then work our way back on this next question. Uh, I realize that some of you did address this in your opening comments, but did your utility, for, for each of you, did your utilities have an inventory of lead service lines, both the public and the private uh, side? And if you did not, how are you going about uh, developing one? Well, as I said, we, we had a very good inventory because we've owned them since 1927. And so that wasn't an issue for us, but we did go that extra mile on those that were unknown, and we did do that, um, asking our customers to self-identify. And that helped us to eliminate some of our additional unknowns. Great. Reed. Yeah, our um, database of public services was very reliable. We're pretty confident in that. Uh, we have a database of private services, but we know it's not reliable. And we don't rely on it at all. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, we're going to be visiting every premise in the municipality over the next three or four years, and we're going to collect a lot of information that way. Uh, we've done things in the past to just, you know, other people that like our meter technicians that have uh, reasons to go into homes, they, they would report back to us. So anytime there's an opportunity, anytime somebody calls us, we also flag um, areas in areas that might have lead services are flagged in our customer database. So anytime there's a count change, at least we can start a conversation with a customer about it. Great. Kathy? We have an inventory of our public side uh, of the, the portion of the, the service line, but not the private side. We did have an opportunity in the mid-2000s, 2003, maybe through 2007, where we put it in an AMR um, system but we weren't thinking at the time that perhaps we should look to see what those service lines were coming into the home. So we, we didn't utilize that, that opportunity to get a private side inventory, but we, did, we do have a robust um, public portion of it inventoried. And John? And, and as I mentioned, we, we have a good inventory of the public side. We've got 6,000 unknowns that we're working on. We'll whittle those down. Uh, on the private side, we did use the AMR installation to collect the data at first. Uh, although we question now whether or not we train the installers who are private contractors to really verify what they have. So the good news is AMR systems themselves need to be replaced. We're in the middle of starting our second round of AMR. Our first one was 2001. And so this time we will collect it all. 
built into our um, uh, work order system is a question that must be answered by anybody that it gets inside a house, change meter, to look at a water quality thing, is what is the composition of pipe coming in? So we double check, triple check, and that's just a new culture we're trying to develop that they will always go in the cellar, take a look at the meter, make sure it's sealed, and uh, take a look at the pipe. Great, thank you. So uh, on this next question, uh, Kathy, I'd like to start with you, if I might, and then John, uh, transition to you. Uh, and I'm asking this question to the two of you because you are working in the larger uh, metropolitan areas uh, with diverse populations uh, and diversity in all forms of, of diversity of a customer base. And recently in uh, the Flint Water Advisory Task Force, in their report, uh, they introduced the idea of lead service lines being an environmental justice issue. Kathy, you, in fact, in your presentation mentioned it as well. You brought up that concern. So would you talk a little bit more about what your utility is doing about that and if you feel it is an environmental justice issue? Um, in the city of Cincinnati, at this point, I don't think it is an, an environmental um, justice issue. Um, but when we first, you know, heard the, the stories of Flint and other situations across the nation, it was a natural question, particularly for me, you know, because just everything in the nation these days seems to be so divided in some way or another. And, and so why not have that also apply to our water systems and our, and our water lines? And so I quickly wanted to see what the data would show us and did we have neighborhoods where we had done more work in that neighborhood and they were perhaps middle to upper, you know, level versus some of the, the poor uh, minority rich neighborhoods. And so we looked at that data and did not see those differences, um, but it's certainly on our radar. Um, we've, we've heard some of those concerns and questions and, and comments have certainly been made in Flint knowing the, that the demographics of that um, city. And so I think it's something that we all need to be aware of as we continue to look at our data and make sure that we are um, equally servicing those different areas as we remove these lead service lines from our systems. Great, thank you. John, do you want to care to address that? Sure, on the, on the public side, we, we believe we've replaced many of the old mains and all the public lead services um, in, in all the neighborhoods. So we're fairly, very good shape on the public side. We, we have plotted the uh, private known um, lead services on a map, and it doesn't appear to be, just, just by plotting them, an, an environmental justice issue. But the problem I have is that a lot of areas that we have, that we have a lot of renters, and, and that the, the building owner doesn't live there. And unless you give them a real good reason, like I'll do it for free and a cash bonus, um, you, you, you can't really get them to care about it. it. It's not something they care about. So you could have the uh, an environmental justice problem being that the, the, the landlords, uh, we can't get them to move on it, and it is a problem. So we're going to try to address it this way, is to make sure that with our public health partners, let the people know that live in these things. If you do have a lead line, and we'll try to identify it, and you can look it up on the website, if you flush the water a lot, then perhaps we can clear it out if any lead. Um, I don't think a landlord really wants to hear the water utility talking about the tenants flushing a lot. So we may be able to create uh, an opportunity here for the landlords to speak to us about getting these things done. So that's the only thing we've come up with, and that's what we think may be the problem. Okay, thank you. David, can I, yes. can I add to Please. that? Um, part of our, our, our outreach program really is just trying to go to those neighborhoods and meet them where they are. If we know a neighborhood, you know, it, in the heart of that neighborhood is a key church, then certainly we're going to have several informational meetings at that key church. If we go to another neighborhood and we know that festivals are their thing, then we're hitting their festivals. I mean, so, so we just need to really hone in on what's important in those neighborhoods, and that's the areas that we're going to, to share information. So, Kathy, you brought up uh, schools, hospitals. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then, Randy, if you can talk about how for your program uh, you've addressed the issues of schools and programs as well. So for, so for us, just recently, we've had a lot of um, phone calls, just inquiries, what should we do? Should we be sampling? This is a school calling us. And it's a combination of the, the publics, the parochial, the, the charter schools. We've got about 167 schools um, of some type in, in Cincinnati. 
And so just having some of those calls come in and their questions are somewhat all over the place. Should I be sampling? Um, should I sample everywhere in my building? I did this a couple years ago. Am I good? Um, should I let my parents know um, that I'm sampling? Should I let them know the results? How should I communicate? All these questions are all over the place. And so it's a reason why we want to meet more and more with them and partner in a better way with them. But we also said it, it's not just the schools. It's certainly the daycares. They're, they've got the younger kids that we certainly need to address. Um, but it's the nursing homes. It's the hospitals. A, a subgroup of those hospitals are the urgent cares that have popped up in, in places. And so it's an older building, perhaps, where these urgent care facilities are pop, popping up. And then there's churches. We know that, that you know, a lot of our communities spend quite a bit of their time in churches. There's preschools in those churches. There's um, after-school programs in the churches as well, and so we just want to reach out to all of those different groups to provide information and let them know, you know, whatever your needs are, this is the data that we have on, on, in our system, and whatever your needs are, if you want to approach it with sampling, then we certainly are there as, in step with you to make it happen. Great. Brandy. Well, one of the benefits we had is that also – most of the hospital schools, whatever they had larger services going to, we never put a service in greater than two inches that was led. So based on just the service size alone, most of those had larger services. So we knew that they were um, most likely cast iron um, at that point in time. Uh, we had been replacing um, anything in the schools or hospitals, whatever, that may have been considered led back as early as 1991. Our issue was really more that in 2004, when we accelerated the program, making sure that we did impact all of the daycares, all of the other sensitive population customers where they may have had a smaller service line going into their facility. But for the most part, just the size of the service alone precluded uh, having to have to do anything. But in 2004, we did verify that they did not have any lead services in the schools. Great. Thank you very much. So, Reed, in your presentation, you really focused heavily on some of the research that you did. Can you talk about why, as part of your strategy, research became such an important piece of, of how you went about your uh, planning for this? Yeah, well, I mean, the research program came to us as an opportunity in 2006, and we're, we're, we're very fortunate. We've got a very talented researcher at Dalhousie University in, in Halifax, and NSERC funds uh, five industrial research chairs in drinking water across Canada, which were one. So uh, they match our contribution 100%. We fund about $140,000, and grad students are very economical. So um, at any time, we've got anywhere from 10 to 20 research projects going on in everything from source water, treatment processes, distribution stuff, public communication. Um, we've learned a lot. A lot of the things we've learned in all areas, we've learned not to do things that we otherwise would have done. The study that talked us out of doing chloramines was another one. But uh, about, it was about 2010, uh, Graham started directing the research to lead and distribution system issues. And we just found project after project, we were learning things. I think we were contributing to the body of knowledge in the industry, but actually learning an awful lot about how our own distribution system behaves. And every time we do another study, we just realize this is a more complex problem. It's a more specific problem. And uh, it's driven us to say the only way we're really going to deal with this is just remove the stuff and not rely on sampling programs and chemistry and testing things, because it's so specific that unless we can sample in every home, uh, we're not really going to know what the exposure of our customers is. All right, so I'm going to ask Reed a follow-up question to what he just talked about. But after that, I'm opening the floor to all of you. So, Reed, if you were to um, make a plea, if mm -hmm. you would, for uh, the next level of research, do you have something on your mind that you, you would hope to see in terms of future research? Well, we're having a source water protection problem that we're working on. That's going to be a focus. But... Um, I think for lead, um, you know, we've done some soft science, I'll call it, or social science type things uh, a little bit. And I really think um, can, being able to convince the customers in a, in a compelling way because, uh, you know, we found when we sit down with customers and we show them the data, uh, if they've got economic means and they're ready to do it, they're likely to do it. 
If they're in an at-risk population, they're likely to do it. But if they're not in one of those boxes, it's a pretty tough sell. And I think we'd like to direct some research towards how do we make that argument to our customers. Uh, so research on communications as opposed to yep. less so the chemistry. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, questions? Yes, right up here, right up front. Good afternoon. I'm Daryl King. I represent the city of Evanston in Illinois. Uh, my question is, has anyone considered or ever thought of, are we making a mistake replacing lead with copper? Wow. So, uh, John, why don't we start with you on that one? <laughs> it's my friend David here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, we, we looked at copper as being another malleable material that we could use to deliver water. Uh, we've seen no ill effects of the copper uh, from our corrosion control. The, the copper levels are down, lower. Um, I don't know of any body of research that says the consumption of copper will cause a particular problem, or if it does, generally the health person who's, you know, advising the person that has the problem will explain that to them and we'll find another method. So, Reed, does your research address this issue of, of the trade-offs between uh, copper and lead? Yeah, interestingly, Health Canada differs with the US EPA on that. Health Canada doesn't believe that uh, copper is a health issue. And uh, even when they cite guidelines, you know, just our situation is we're orders of magnitude below whatever copper numbers are out there. So it doesn't appear to be an issue for us. But because of the focus, we haven't spent a lot of time on it. But, you know, we have very acidic soil. So I'm worried about when we do have areas where we get a lot of uh, corrosion of not that old copper services as well. So from that sort of infrastructure integrity point of view, we're you, It's a, a different bit, challenge. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes, one question over here. Hi, Marley Franzen with DC Water. I just have a trivia question about identifying lead services. Um, I know that vacuum ex excavation is very expensive. And the question, the other part I also know is that water quality can also often have a fingerprint. So in water security, they'll look at different parameters and based on the magnitude and ratios, they can identify if a compound is in the water. So my question is, has anyone done any research or looking at, are, is there a fingerprint that we can use so that we can pull a sample? Or even like, I think in Halifax, you were saying like you do multiples, mm -hmm. or you may be low, and then you do a certain volume of water. Um, has, that, has anyone done anything with that to save money on trying to figure out, hey, where are my lead services? Or so, confirming them without digging? So Reed, you talked about using uh, the various leaders and going out eight to 10 leaders Mm -hmm. uh, and testing there, and you found some results. Does does that help here? Yeah, we. I mean, what that told told us was once again it was how variable it was. Uh, ben Truman's research is he's working on his PhD, and it's part of a. It was a very small project as part of a, a bigger program. I, I don't think we've done anything specifically to address what what you said, but uh, you know what that told us is it's that's definitely coming from the service. It's coming from actually very out, close to the street if you're into an eighth liter, and, and it just showed us, uh, um, you, you know, people do a first liter, sometimes they do the first four liters, occasionally people do six liters, very few people do 12. I mean, we certainly don't do 12 liters regularly, but that was quite concerning to us when we saw the ninth to the tenth liters with high lead. Right. Anyone else? Yeah, Randy. Yeah. Um, Several months ago, we had the uh, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, the Geological Survey Division, show up on site and ask if they could steal some of our lead main. And of course, I didn't really just want to give it to them, so we asked them what they were doing with it. Well, they're actually working on trying to develop a signature using ground penetrating radar that they could use to identify the difference between the service type. They haven't been very effective at it so far, but they're still working on that project. Um, and I know that there are several others as well also that are working on trying to find some non-destructive or non-invasive ways of trying to determine uh, what's lead and what is not lead. So this is an above ground technology? Above ground, it's just a antenna that they walk across the ground and yeah. based on the signature this that it is, bounces I've back. I've been talking about this. This is the guy who at the beach would walk around with his little scanner looking for coins. Well, it's not quite, it's not that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would might work if it, if it worked, but. But this is, this is something also that, um, you know, we've had some people talk to us about, you know, trying to utilize satellite 
technology because they can change and they can detect. In theory, they'll tell you they can tell the difference between various metals hmm. located underground. But this is something that, you know, GPR is relatively inexpensive and people could just simply walk a neighborhood and determine the. So that would help with the location. Mm -hmm. That would be mm -hmm. fantastic. Paul Reinch from the city of Saginaw, Michigan. This is probably mainly for Randy, but it became clear to me as I was listening that the private versus public ownership issue is a big one. Yep. And you know, everyone's trying to figure out how we're going to have our people um, incentivize them or what we're gonna do to have them be willing to change their lines. So for Randy, um, for most of us, our question or our concern is liability. Now is there something that you did or your facility did to protect it from liability of the home in terms of its foundation. Um, you mentioned brush and shrubs and things like that, but is there anything that you've done in your rules or regulations or other documents that protect your community from the liability of replacing those lines? Well, it's not, there's nothing in there that protects us from the liability of us causing damage as part of our replacement program. So we have a risk management section and we have uh, people that will go in a customer is more than welcome to file a claim if they feel that we caused damage to their property, either their foundation or whatever else. I will tell you right now, we have paid for some foundation repairs. We have paid for you know other things. Um, the technique that we use is so non-invasive that by pulling the services out and pulling them back in, our typical repair is a small amount of hydraulic cement around the hole because we'll take the hole where the, the lead was at, we'll chisel out around it with a small air hammer, and then we'll just repair that with hydraulic cement when we're done, and it works the majority of the time. But that doesn't mean that we do not have some cost, but we want to make sure that we're not replacing a foundation or repairing a foundation that's been bad for the last 20 years, and this is just an excuse for it. So we have a process in place by which we send our risk management team out to make an inspection, make a determination, and work with the homeowners um, until they're satisfied. So Kathy, you know, the idea of the, the more typical public versus private side of the service line, do you, do you see some risks? I mean, you talked about your, your employees that you have on the committee, and there were attorneys on that, and you must have put attorneys on that committee because you saw some risks. Oh, yeah, without right? a doubt. Um, that was a big concern of ours. You know, we even initially talked about, you know, are we talking about staffing up more of our employees to actually go and do this work on the, on the private side versus, you know, working with, with contractors and plumbers to do the work. But th there's a huge risk there. And, and certainly it's something that we backed away from. Um, we haven't had any history of, of doing work on the private side, and so we decided that our recommendation moving forward was not so much that we will be doing the work, but perhaps we can, can work with the contractors or plumbers that are out, out there doing our portion and, and um, impact the, the, the cost range by perhaps having them, you know, be certified on some type of list so that, that the customers are aware that, number one, this is someone from the list of who we're saying is certified to do the work, and perhaps as they're doing hours, the customer can work with them to do the private side as well. But we um, backed away from possibly, you know, considering doing any kind of work on the private side. Great. John, you like to join? Yeah, we do work on the, on the private side. We haven't signed a waiver form. And for all the ones we've done, no one's ever come back and challenged us. We do use the same techniques they use in Lansing of pulling the service. Every now and then, and it's very rare, you're in there with a backhoe digging up a front lawn, and we do the best we can. But the waiver told them that if we have a problem, we're going to dig a hole and restore it to a safe condition. That could be debatable. No one's ever come back and challenged us. Be interested in a copy of that. Yeah. Oh, no. We can, we can send you the copy of it. Um, it could be that the Boston people don't read them either, so. <laughs> 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 Sir. Gary Brown, I uh, sit on the board of directors for the Great Lakes Water Authority in Michigan, and I think we provide water for about 60% of the state. Yep. But I'm the director of the Detroit Water and Sewage Department, which is where my question comes in. I mean, and for me, it's a matter of scale. I mean, I have upwards of 125,000 or more public-private service lines, that's probably more than everybody up on, on the panel combined. And I haven't heard anybody say that they believe that you shouldn't replace the complete line. I hear it's an issue of cost, so you're going back to your local 
uh, governments, and I sat on city council, so I kind of know where that's, where that's going to end up. Um, and, I, and I think we all know that the EPA, within the next couple of years, 18 months, is going to come out and say, we have to replace the complete line. And in my city, I'm dealing with 40% uh, poverty in the city. We're coming a year and a half out of bankruptcy. I've got 20,000 people that are actually having their water shut off. It's national news. And so how are we going to fund? How are we going to fund replacing 125,000? over the time periods. I heard 30 years for less than 10,000. I got 125 to 150,000. How do we fund this? And our, our customers cannot, right. cannot pay for this. We're so, going to have to fund it. So that's a great question. Uh, and what we do know is we don't know what, whether the EPA will come out and say what you're speculating. We do know that they have a council that is called the National Drinking Water Advisory Council that has advised that the lead service lines be replaced in their entirety. But um, you agree it's the right thing to do? And I believe, Whether they recommend I, I, it or I'm seeing head right nods thing. along here, and, and AWWA does agree with the NIDWAC report, and we support the NIDWAC report to replace all lead service lines. But you bring up an important part uh, of the lead and copper rule about shared responsibility, and shared responsibility at all levels of government, right? And so I was wondering if, if our panel would like to speak a little bit about how we share in that responsibility financially uh, with our customers and with our s local, state, and federal government? It's a great question you asked, I can tell. <laughs> well, uh, I'll jump in on that, is that it, it may be the whole affordability issue isn't just in the water systems of, of cities. It's got to do with the sewer systems in the cities and the CSO problems in the cities, and things are getting, there is a, a portion of the population where it is unaffordable. So we've got to make a decision how we deal with that unaffordable portion of it. Whether it becomes a, a system cost and then we build it into our rates, which is in, in the case that you described, seems the only way you can deal with it because you're not going to get the individuals. I'm still not certain that we can't have these pipes. We need to replace them eventually. Everything's going to be replaced eventually. But the time frame may be that we can treat the water and chemically coat and, and a lot of other opportunities for us to keep the water safe along with flushing. So we extend this time in circumstances such as you're dealing with. But the affordability issue, it goes way beyond lead service pipes. It's got to do about the, you know, we talk about the human right for water. Well, there's the, everyone has the right to get water, but we also have the right to help pay for it. We've got to come up with a better system, whether it be through state, and I'm not sure if federal is the right answer, um, or whether it almost winds up like taxing. We, we seem to be heading more and more to taxing in order to get water. The, the wealthier will pay the bulk of the cost to get the water delivered. And I'm not sure where that's going. I know the uh, major associations are all looking at affordability. I know the EPA is looking at affordability. And so I don't think the answer to your question is sitting in front of us yet, because I don't think we've looked at it deep enough to come up with a, an absolute decision on it. But it's not just water. It's, it's our sewer systems and it's our, our clean water issues all coming down together as, a, as an input on cities. And it's something we've got to deal with. We've had, I don't know how many discussions about this, you know, but it, it boils down to, you know, just a lot of, of challenges that we have, you know. But as much as we say, and we've had this discussion, put it back on the landlords, you know, we have we have slum lords, and slum lords will be slum lords. I mean, that's just the nature uh, of what's out there. And although they shouldn't be, they are. You know, so we can expect that we'd have a similar situation here. That as much as we're saying you need to do this as a landlord, will they do this? You know, and and so it's just a huge challenge, and and certainly we don't have any any answers to it. Um, but. It's one of the reasons why we said we can't just go for a, for loan programs. We've got to figure out grants. We've even internally discussed, you know, me hitting the streets and going to talk to corporations and saying, you know, you're trying to you're trying to give back and help the community. Give me some money to help, you know, get these lead service lines out of the system. I mean, so it's it's certainly all over the place, and we recognize um, that we don't have an answer yet. Um, but it's a huge challenge, and and certainly. Um, yours seems to be much bigger than maybe some of the smaller portions that we have to deal with. Um, but, but we don't have those answers yet. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you're here to ask that question, in part because all eyes do turn towards Detroit. 
and the changes that have happened there. And we know that your situation is just one at, one at an extreme, but you're probably not alone. And, the, and I suppose the good news is that more conversation is happening about how do we solve the financial problems. And the ideas that water is cheap for all people is going away. And we know that that's not the case anymore. So new solutions have to come on the forefront. OK. Please. Hi. Um, I'm Eric Olson with Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I guess I, this is largely a question for Kathy, but maybe others. Um, Cincinnati was way ahead of the curve by installing granular activated carbon back years ago, and um, I think has been widely cited as a leader in the industry for that reason. Um, I wonder about. I think you said that there are about 16,000 lead service lines that you've partially replaced, if that's correct. Um, and I'm wondering, sort of, now that you're hearing that a lot of your colleagues and a lot of other um, folks in the industry are s looking at partial lead service line as replacement as not really solving the problem, um, are you looking at other ways, such as basically denial of service if people refuse? Um, to allow you on their property to pull a lead service line, something along the lines of um, basically subsidizing um, by putting it into the rate base for the entire city and then just saying, look, if you've got a lead service line, we're going to pull it and that's going to be subsidized by the entirety of the city and maybe dealing with low income folks through a rate structure that can mm -hmm. deal with it. So I, I worry about you've got 10,000 more service lines, potent lead service lines to replace. Um, continuing to do the partial may actually be exacerbating the problem. So, so, so for Cincinnati, again, we we started in back in 1971 when we had about 26,500 lead service lines, and we didn't at that time have a defined separate lead service um, line replacement program. If we removed them, it was it was because we had a water main replacement program there. So as we were out. Um, for some reason, replacing that water main, if we saw that it was a lead service line, then we felt we shouldn't leave it in the ground. And so because of that, it was partials that we were doing, and we've continued that. And so from 26,500, we're down to the 16,500 that we are now. And again, our existing program is because of the water main replacement program. And so it, as we see that there's problems or if there's breaks, um, we're replacing that portion. We struggle, certainly, with knowing that it is a partial because we want to have a complete removal. But at this point, um, we have the picture kits that we've been providing to customers. We know that, that you know, there's more situations that are coming out that's saying that we shouldn't do partials, um, but we have some portion of the, the line that's coming out of the system, and then we work with those customers after that. But it ideally, we would want complete removals. And, and if we had a way that we could certainly address that and have a complete removal, then we would be doing that and would have been doing that sooner versus later. But our, our, our laws say that our water revenues can only be used for the public portion, and that's why we try to work so closely with the customers to offer them, hey, we're here. This is what we can tell you about your portion. Do you want to change it out? And bottom line, it comes down to cost. It You know, we've had customers over the years say, you know, I can't afford $2,500 to, to $5,000 to, to remove that portion, and I didn't see it coming. You know, you're here for some other reason, and now you're telling me this, and I, I can't afford to do that. And so we've continued. We're, we are at that crossroads of trying to figure out what we'll do, um, but we still have our water main replacement program in place, and that's why we're proposing the complete removal and finding different ways that we can assist those customers with their portion. So, Kathy, you're proposing that, Reed, you had a program which was doing partials, and then you just stopped mm -hmm. doing that. Can you talk a little bit about that and contrast that a little bit on the question here? Yeah, well, and I think compared to how I understand Kathy's situation, we were far enough down the road, you know, starting with 15,000 years and years ago to 2,500 left. So, as a result, we're not replacing water mains on streets that have a lot of lead services. But we've got enough candidates to replace water mains for the time being we can uh, we can avoid those, but we feel we really need uh, we, we want to get into a situation where we can identify communities that we can say there's enough people interested in here that we can go in and work on that street 
and over a period of two to three years, bring through education and given the customers time to plan for it and explaining the importance that, the, that we can bring enough customers along that we'll be able to go in on work on that street. We don't know if we're going to be able to do that, but uh, that's how we're designing our program. Uh, but you know what? There's some people that just can't because, uh, and, and those are perhaps the toughest cases when you talk to those people because they understand the health issue, they maybe are a sensitive population, and it's just not in their budget, and there's no way it's going to be in their budget. So, you know, in our jurisdiction, we're talking to places, you, you know, in Canada, we perhaps tend to have a few more government programs. I know in Nova Scotia, there's one to help keep seniors in their homes. So we're talking to the province, you know, don't change the program, just make lead service line replacement part of that program. You know, so seniors can get help with home improvements so they don't have to move into a, a senior's facility. Um, you, you know, we think that we're looking at our rules with our utility board, but you know, most homeowners, it's, it's, it is the private property and, and I'm not sure it's right that the entire rate base should have to pay for, pay for all of it. Okay. One more question. Jamie, can I just add oh, to yes, that? Please, please. Um, even with the, the water mains that we are replacing, th there's some type of challenge with that water main. It's not as if we have a list and they've hit, you know, 100 years old and therefore we're going after it because of that. We're seeing where there's perhaps problems with pressure in that area or there's several leaks more than it used to be on that water main and therefore we've got to do something. So as we do that, that's when we're noticing certainly that from our data and what we find out there, the lead service lines are there, so we're doing the work, and that's because we're removing them as well. Right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. So on the question of, essentially, the question of the lead and copper rule and the 90 percent, right, and how that works in, in evaluating uh, or triggering uh, treatment corrosion control. Does anyone here have a, a good answer for that? Well, the, the way we do it in, in Boston is we, we take the whole MWRA district because we have one central water supply, so we have 450 samples taken. Um, and we, we do it in accordance with the rule. I mean, you're, you're told where to take them and how to take them. You're told to go to a single family residence. You, there are tier twos, you can go to multiple families if you want, but you're told to go to the ones with the most probable um, high lead. So if you've got a house and it's got a lead service and you know it does, that's where you go to take the sample. And you do it and you have a residence time of the water sitting in um, for a certain period of time. You can't do it less than that. So that we try to standardize it. And as you see the results that uh, many people have, uh, they violate the action level. They're over the 15 parts. It's not as accurate as you would. This is a sampling system to decide whether or not your corrosivity uh, work that you're doing to lower the corrosion is working. Okay. Was there a question over here? Yes, right. Oh, you've been waiting a long time, too. Hi, I'm Rob Astle with EcoWater. Um, my question is also for Kathy, who's very popular today. <laughs> uh, you indicated that you provide uh, pitcher kits to customers with lead service lines. Uh, I'm wondering two things. How is that funded, and can you comment to the uh, popularity or acceptance uh, from customers as maybe a lower cost protection? So <clears throat> the, the funding of those pitcher kits, again, it's, it's, it's occurring when we're out there doing our water main replacement program, which is a capital project. And so it, it's a portion of that. However, <clears throat> excuse me, one second. We, <clears throat> we do have our distribution division which goes out and does some additional replacements. And so those are funded out of our operating budget. So we have a combination of some funding that occurs with the water main replacement program through capital, and then the other part is through our operating budget. Um, you know, the, the reception at, from our customers it has been, you know, at some points odd. You know, we, we tell them what we've done, you know, and, and we've been about to replace these uh, water mains and, and we explain that we've um, taken out the, the portion of the service line that is ours and because we've disturbed the line here's this picture kit you know and some of them are you know appreciative that we've done that others are just kind of nonchalant okay thanks you know and so we kind of walk away thinking do they really get it do they really understand we try to circle back and, and make sure that they understand what we're telling them to do 
um, after we've disturbed the line. But there's a, there's a combination of um, very appreciative of what we're doing that extra step and then those that, that perhaps might not get it as much and, and need more um, communication, which was a big part of why we, we've been hitting our communication efforts so hard. It's, it's just a, a variation of what people know, and certainly they're hearing it in, the, in the, the media every day. There's some type of article across the country. And so we just wanted to take a stance and, and be that outlet, their own water utility, to communicate on a regular basis to educate them about what's going on with our system. Steve. And then Steve back there. I'm up. I'll do it. Yes, please. This is Buddy Morgan with the Montgomery Water Works. And Kathy, like you and we are in Montgomery, our responsibility ends at the meter. Uh, we don't go on private <coughs> property. Our bond indenture says no free services, and that means to stay off the private services. The question I have for all of you, and none of you have said it, most of us, when we put a service line in, it's up to the property line, or when the developer puts it in, it's up to the property line, which is nine and a half feet behind the curb. That's where our right of ways end. The question I have asked, where is the cities and all of this process? They're the ones that inspected the house plumbing. They inspected the house sideline, but they don't seem to be involved in this. The next question would be, if there's an issue with a property that you've got slumlords, and we're blessed with them in Montgomery just like everywhere else, then why not get the public health department involved with a city building inspector to go in there and say, this is a public housing hazard. We're going to not let this house be inhabited until this is corrected. Then you put it back on the errant owner of the property who doesn't seem to want to keep his property up. Then you make provisions for the family that lives there that owns the property that may be in an indigent situation. Then you work out some kind of process through the city who has the ability to take and, and issue money to a person and then attach the property until the money is repaid. These are things that need to be explored before we go off tearing out and start spending countless billions of dollars. What we have is a public perception, and every one of them has talked about the trust that we have been entrusted with in our communities. They know our water is safe. We live there, and it's an issue of perception. It's not anything else. It's socialized by a runaway media in Flint, uh, you know, I dare say that anybody could pick up a glass of water out there and show me the lead in it. You know, these are the kind of stupid things that we're doing. And we've got to bring common sense back to this. Nobody wants to, I, I don't know of any industry leader that would want to see anybody that we serve drink tainted water on any case. No way. We get back to the source water protection and the wellhead protection programs. We go out, we analyze, we find constituents in there. We turn it into our state agency. We turn it into EPA. What do they do? Nothing. It's never addressed. It always falls back on the utilities to try to solve all the problems. Well, we didn't put it there, and a lot of times we can't take it out. We put the lead in them from our main to the street to the house. We'll take care of that. And then we work to find a remedy to get the lead that's in the house. But the issue, too, has not been addressed about the fixtures. Right. You still have fixtures in the house. So just getting all the service lines doesn't totally address the whole issue. And back to the question about sampling, I wouldn't trust any of the people that we're dealing with to get the sample done correctly. You know, it, it's a fouled up system in, in sampling. We, we put a cock behind the meter, so we pull our sample there. We don't even want to be up on private property trying to pull from a hose bib. So that's just some questions and thoughts. All right. So, Kathy, Kathy, would you like to start us off? Sure. So your, your one question about, you know, the landlords and what can we do in that area. Actually, our report to our council members certainly wasn't just to uh, have them decide what scenario for our, for our lead service line replacement program, but it had all these other things that we considered, you know, and categorized as low-hanging fruit. You know, so can we impact and change any disclosure for, forms on, for homeowners trying to, to sell their home? Can we um, have some type of ordinance passed that will impact landlords and having to disclose that information to renters and or stop them, you know, from renting if, if it's possible uh, until they change out their lead service line? It was a long um, laundry list of additional things that we put in our report to our council members to say, not only are we talking about this, this public portion um, being funded um, for us to do, 
but we also need the customer assistance program, and here's all these additional things that we do. So I think um, we are trying to think about those things and move forward to realize that it's years coming before we get all of this out of the ground, but there's steps that we can take along the way that can have an impact and can change um, and provide more notification to customers along the way. Great, thank you. Anything more? All right. Okay. And right over here, sir. Okay. I'm Andy Ferry, Charleston Water System. Uh, I believe that we were going to see a lot of different levels of answers uh, on how to address this issue of getting these lead service lines replaced. Kathy kind of hinted to this. Uh, what I was going to ask, has there been any thought about a national discussion of getting the mortgage companies, the mortgage industry involved so that, you know, if a home is, especially if it's getting a federal loan, the new buyer, new owner could be allowed to finance the replacement of the lead service and even if there's a, uh, you know, premise plumbing that is, uh, you know, has lead and someone had mentioned bronze fixtures, brass fixtures that have a high percentage of lead. So that would be a national discussion to have uh, beyond just the water industry, but it would provide a method for certain categories of the population to be able to absorb that cost on the private side of the property. So just something to think about in the future. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody heard anything about that? No, but there is the issue with the lead paint and the lead window, you know, windows and all that, and we've got a lot of experience with it, but um, people would, in Massachusetts, you disclose whether there's lead paint, but there's no mandate that you deal with it. And the only time you wind up dealing with it is if, if a child comes up with a higher blood level, then in come the public health authorities to take a look at it. Because one, one of the issues I have is you, just because you have a lead line and you've got an excellent corrosion control, you may have lead in the water, and if you flush it after that, a small amount, but there is no maximum contaminant level. We have a goal of zero, but we don't have a, a spot, so I don't know how we get in and order someone to slumlord or not. This has got to come out of here because it's a particular problem. So that's a little bit of a difficulty that I'm sure over the next two or three years is going to be sorted out. Hi, I'm Dave Copus with the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, um, and I have a question for Randy and for Kathy. When you, um, when you send out 15,000 or 20,000 letters to the owners of those homes with the lead service lines, I was wondering, like, what kind of uh, uh, response did you get? Did you get a lot of calls back when you sent out those 20,000 letters? And did they take you up on the uh, offer? How many of them took you up on the offer to have the water tested? I'm just curious to know, if we send out 20,000 letters, what kind of a response might we expect? Um, for Cincinnati, we did see, we, we have been tracking, I showed you that dashboard, so we had been tracking, um, you know, early in the year what was going on, what we were seeing per day, the number of calls, the number of people asking for samples, and, and you know, at that time, um, it wasn't a lot, you know, if we had a day where it was 10 people calling us or, or, or asking for the water to be sampled, that was a, a high number in a day. And so we certainly continued to track that right up until the point when we sent the, sent the letters. And in addition to that, we got media coverage for sending those letters, several different pieces. We had newspapers that came out and interviewed us. We had TV coverage. We had um, uh, a gentleman, it's called John Matteris, um, Don't Waste Your Money. You know, so he certainly did a little segment that he does on a regular basis. All of those things happened, and it just got that attention out there. And so we did see an increase. And again, um, you know, from our perspective, it was the right thing to do. So we were sending those letters, and we knew that we could get hit hard. Um, we did see a lot of those customers come back and ask for their water to be tested. Um, today, I, I think we sit at about, we're close to 1,400 requests for sample kits to be sent out to customers. Um, the challenge is not that we can send the sample kits. they got to send them back, right? And, and so, you know, prior to even anything that was happening that made this a national issue, we'd see 30 to 40 percent of people who said they wanted their water tested send the, the actual bottles back, and this was no different. So we actually had some co-ops present in our building, and we put them on the phones, call each and every one of those customers that we sent sample kits and encourage them to collect the sample properly and return it to us. So recently we've seen those numbers go back up to about 51, 52 percent returned but we're still after those customers to, to, um, to, to send those bottles in. To date, we've, we've analyzed about 500 
samples, and at this point we've seen um, about 12 samples that have been greater than 15 parts per billion. And so with that, we follow up with phone calls as well as the letters that we're required to send to those customers, but we want to talk to them directly on the phone and explain what their results are saying, and we've just recently started um, providing to them a, a faucet filter um, just because of, of, of a concern there, particularly if they uh, have younger kids in the home, particularly if they have babies in the home. If they're making formula, you know, we certainly want to impact that, that faucet and what might be coming out of there um, until we know more information and can do a further investigation of what's happening in that home. And, and so we've seen, you know, that actually is working for us, um, but, but we knew we would get a lot of attention and a lot of people asking for samples, and it certainly proved to be true. We sent out letters to all of our customers at one point in time. And then after the initial sending out saying whether you don't have a lead service or whether you do, um, we do use the letters still to this day. Back in February, we sent out at that point in time, we had 600 remaining active services. And we were having difficulty scheduling jobs. There just wasn't anybody that wanted us to come in and replace the service. We sent out a batch of letters. We got 150 of them replaced within the next couple of months after that. So we do tend to get a fairly good response rate, but our issue is that we're getting down to such a low number now that there are just those people that don't want us in there at all. So, I mean, we actually are prepared. Our commissioners have approved that uh, when we get down to the last few in order to completely eliminate the services, we are willing to go in and shut off their service as a condition of service until they make contact with us and we can get in and replace the service at that point in time. I, I will add, though, you know, just in a recent conversation with a customer, um, you know, their, their result came back and it was slightly higher than 15. I think it was 18 or 19. Um, and, and that conversation with them was, you know, we're, we are in our 60s, and so you've told us that we might want to flush our water before we use it, but, but we're not interested in, in changing our, our lead service line. And that gets back to, you know, what I've said before. It, is it compelling enough for these customers to, to spend the money to change their, their lead service line out? And at this point, that's a concern of ours, particularly since we have the public and the private portion with ownership. Let's do uh, two last questions for the group, and we'll do it just like we start off. John, we'll start with you. We'll work our way down to Randy. Uh, and so for the first question, what advice would you give to a utility that would like to start a lead service line replacement program? Well, I think the first thing they should do is talk to people who have programs to find out what mistakes they made so they don't need to repeat them. Um, I think the inventory is the most important thing. But if you, if you were to contact any of us up here or any that are local to you or go through your, your local AWWA sections, you'll find out people, what they're doing, Everyone has a whole history of what's working well. That's what you usually hear them present. But what you really want to find out what didn't work, so you don't do that. So that that's what I do. Same thing that John's saying. Um, you know, with our 25-member lead team, you know, I told all of them, contact all your resources, all the people that you know that are in the water utility industry, and ask them if they have a program and what's working and what's not working. And from there, we can at least have a sense of, of where we might want to go as we put together you know, a process and a report to our council members. Great. Um, you know, I, I think data collection is a big thing because I think you need to understand the, the, the problem, and, and that can be a quite daunting thing, but I think you have to start somewhere. So I, I would take advantage of opportunities. If you can convince your local real estate board to get the lead service on the health, uh, on the disclosure form, I think that's a big deal. Um, and, you know, we offer service replacements for people that will, are prepared to do their own. So, I mean... That's people that, that are able, but you know what, at least it's a start, and uh, that's, that for us at least has been an amount that we could manage. We'd like to do more of those, actually. And Randy. Well, I think it's important that you build the support within the community very early on. I mean, we, we all know that this is an issue. It's a nationwide issue. Um, I think sometimes just talking with the public and letting them know that you actually have a program, that you're working on it, allays a lot of the fears and the misperceptions. Great. So, Randy, we'll start with you. We'll work this way uh, for our final question before I provide a few closing comments. Um, Randy, you know, we've heard a lot today about complications from today, but a lot of people talking about the future. And I was hoping you would use your crystal ball 
as well as the rest of your colleagues, and tell us where this issue will be 10 years from now. Well, I think 10 years from now, we'll still be having these same conversations. Um, I think that for some utilities, for instance, Detroit, you're not going to solve this in 10 years. You'll be solving this over 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And I also think that um, this is an issue that, you know, we, we have some likelihood that the, the limits are going to change from a regulatory standpoint. And as the regulations change, things that we can't even think of today are likely going to come into play in the near future. So, um, you know, I, I fully support, you know, uh, utilizing the AWWA and the Research Foundation and other groups, um, you know, let them put their focus on on these things and you know and stay active within those groups to stay up to date on what is coming down the pipeline. Okay, Breed. I'd like to see that we have a new paradigm of what I'd like to see is a new paradigm of what the partnership is with our customers. I, I keep coming back to there's just a, so many barriers for customers or lack of a compelling reason to do their lead service line. And, and I come back to, you know, and my utility today is no different than every other utility in the room. We, we don't go on private property unless we absolutely have to. We certainly don't dig or fix anything on private property. But what, what do all utilities do when a customer has a lead service line problem? We tell them, you got to call a contractor. You got to do, the, you got to get insurance. And they say, can you tell me which contractor? And we say, no. And, you know, if you're a homeowner and you're not used to that stuff, you don't know what contractors to call. You don't know about the quality control. You're scared to death that a $2,000 estimate's going to end up costing you $20,000. And that's all stuff that utilities, those are all things that utilities do every day and do very well. So I would like to think that we figure out a way to reframe that partnership. So maybe the partnership doesn't mean we're putting money onto private property, but maybe we can just get over the liability part somehow and help customers remove some of the barriers. Very good. Kathy. You know, where we are today with, with the lead in, in, the, in our water systems, it, it's a game changer for the water utility industry. You know, my first boss back in 1992, Jack DeMarco, um, said, you know, for years to come, sometime in the future, there's going to be one issue that's going to hit every water utility across the country, and that issue is lead. And here we are, you know, sitting in the midst of that. So 10 years from now, um, we'll still be in the midst of figuring this out. But I think along that road, hopefully we've learned how to be um, better partners with our customers to truly understand what um, they need and, and have more of a connection with them to communicate on a regular basis. And we've figured out ways for us to provide water um, in a more affordable way to all groups and classes across the, the nation. Okay. So certainly I think we will be in, into the heart of all of that 10 years from now. In John. Yeah, I think we'll still be discussing it. I think we'll know a lot more um, on the treatment. I think we'll know a lot more of where our lead is and, and how our testing capabilities may be better to be able to tell the homeowner what's what. I would, I would certainly hope that we'll be able to get to a point that upon the sale of homes, I think that's a great way to catch people. The new person buying it can have it done or it can be a condition of the sale. That's a barrier, though, that's very difficult. We try to do it on sewer laterals. We didn't realize how powerful the real estate group is, and they, have, they are tough. Well, thank you guys for, for that. Let me just make a couple quick observations. Um, I think there's general agreement on a few things. One, this is a public health, public health issue, and that's at the top of the concerns for everyone who's involved in it. Also there, we heard a lot about the importance of communication and building trust with our customers. You know, and for an industry that's been historically known as the silent service, and no media is good media, I think that's clearly been changing. We also heard the positive aspects of data and research. We heard about the complications of affordability and finance and the complications of the responsibility of who owns which portion of the line and how that changes the game on how we attack this problem. You know, I started off this session by saying this was the most important thing in water today. And I, I cited a couple of things. One is I said, this is complicated but solvable. And when we start to talk about it in isolation, it just seems so easy. You get the lead service lines out. But when we get down into the nitty gritty, we, we realize that it is complicated, but it's still solvable. I also said that there are individual solutions for each community. And in fact, we will need individual solutions for each community. And we've assembled a panel that shows 
four different approaches to the same problem. And, we, I, and, and to counterbalance the idea of individual solutions, I noted that by sharing our practices with each other, we will help each other. And hopefully we achieved that today as well. Thank you all very much and have a nice day.